Welcome to Digital Marketing That Puts People First, brought to you by The Online Co., where we believe the best way to help businesses grow is to do exactly that, put people first. I'm James Parnwell, and in this episode, we're going to discuss the four stages of putting together an SEO exploration and 12-month rollout plan. When someone goes to build a house, they engage an architect to make plans so that the house doesn't fall down and so that it's functional to actually live in. SEO is pretty much the same. We need a rock solid plan so that we can spend the following 12 months putting together the SEO processes that'll make your website be found by more people so you can get more leads and grow your business. Today, I am joined by Rich Brown. G'day, Rich. Hello. Tell me, what does SEO look like when there's no plan? Uh, It's a little like you just you're relying on luck to get in to be seen on Google. You're you might get lucky, but you most likely won't be lucky because your competitors are probably doing SEO. It just doesn't look. It, it's murky. Okay, it's, it's so it's probably like not a positive. So like I might build a. You sit down and do some SEO. I might uh, might build a backlink, or I might uh, I might optimize something, or I'll I'll have a look at Search Console and see what hits me. It kind of. Yeah. Just it's there's so many things to cover in SEO, so many bases to make sure that you've covered that if you don't have a plan, you just do a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this and you never really get anywhere, you just spin your wheels. So if you're if you create a plan and you focus on specific areas and work through those tasks, then you know you're going to make a planned headway. Yeah, you're going to get some improvements. Yeah. yeah, over time. Yeah. It takes time. Right. I suppose if you go and build a house without a plan, like what do you what do you get? <laughs> yeah. You get a shack that blows over when the wind blows. Or... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think and, the and other. This... Yeah. No. You go. Ahead. Ahead. I was just gonna make a joke. You know, the, if you're really really lucky, you might get something that's really cool, but probably not. <laughs> but yeah. Odds. You're not playing good odds. No. The other thing that we see is when clients come and speak to us and they're looking for SEO. So the typical thing they say to us is, I don't know what's happening. Yeah. Like I have this SEO company. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what they're doing. Uh, what what that points to is that there's no, there's no plan. Or if there is a plan, it hasn't been shared with them. Yeah. I, I, I'd guess that there's actually no plan. It's just sort of month to month. The, comp, the, the, the agency's just month to month doing some things. Yeah. And and the other thing is I don't know if it's working. And that's a communication problem around uh here's the actions we've done and here's the result. The result being rankings one, traffic two, leads three. Yeah. So but they link back to the plan, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, so shall we get into it? We'll start with stage one of building of doing an SEO exploration and that is keyword mapping. Yes. So why do you think we should do keyword mapping like first thing? I guess the simplest way to break it down would be clarity. So a lot of times business owners will go and they think they know what their focus keywords should be. They're like, "Oh, this is my list and it's not quite right. They're kind of in the right ballpark, but Okay. There's, there's a lot of tools um, that you can use to explore that set of keywords and zero in on the ones that actually have value. So they might think a keyword's a good one, but either not many people are using that term yeah, or the intent for that term's wrong. Like people might be typing in, so we talk about informational intent or transactional intent. They're looking for transactional searches, people that want to buy something from them, but they might have a informational intent. Uh, or even mixed. And so people are searching that term. I often see that with vague keywords like, um, what's an example we had? I'm just trying to think. I think it was a speech therapy or speech pathologist. Those, they're they're like, oh, they're the same thing. But speech pathologist came up with lots of uni courses and speech therapy came up with speech therapists, specifically if it's like speech therapy Sydney. So the, yep. they sound like the same word, but then the intent behind people searching them is different. So Google gives gives different results. 
And also, I, I've noticed that people who aren't trained in SEO tend to go after the keyword. They, they want to go after the keywords that have high search volume. And those aren't actually probably, most often, those aren't the ones you actually want to go after. You want to go after the more specific keywords, what we call long tail keywords. The broad ones with the large search volume are not, you know, you, you don't want to ignore them. They kind of, they kind of, those could be your top level category keywords, you know, to define that whole set of keywords that you create. But uh, yeah, oftentimes business owners come to us and they're like, I want to rank for this keyword and it's maybe one word and it's really broad and it's like, you're, you're not going to rank for that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I, I remember a, a client that did awnings yeah. and like, if you want to rank for the term awnings, well, like they yeah. did house, house awnings. There's, there's also caravan awnings. Um, yeah. Well, so yeah. So what are people looking? It's just vague. Yeah. Uh, whereas specific types of awnings or specific types of plantation shutters means people actually know what they're looking for and they're probably more ready to buy, and yeah, they're probably and, easier to rank for. <laughs> yeah, and especially if they include local terms because that's yeah you want to know where you can find it locally and easily. Uh, and, and sometimes people who are selling products don't realize that they're competing with big guys like Amazon and Bunnings, depending on the products that they're selling. So okay. you really want to get super specific because, you know, those broad terms, especially for products are usually, you know, dominated by the big guys. Yeah. All right. So I think there's a separate podcast just on keyword strategy. Sure. We could probably yeah. dive deeper on that one. Yeah. yeah. So. I think the other thing when a when a business owner uh, comes, they're often looking at the, 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 you mentioned they have a list. That list might have ten keywords in it. Yeah. Like, how many keywords would you typically have in a keyword map? Uh, up to a thousand, between five hundred and a thousand, depending on the size of the business. If there's if they only do one product or service, it might be smaller than that. But it's never yeah. less than a hundred, is it? It's like a no. hundred would be tiny. We did yeah. one the other day that was quite specific. And I think it was like 250. It was one of the smallest yeah. we've ever done. Yeah. But again, they only did a very specific one thing and that was, yeah. Right. So if you're doing, um, you, you think, oh, we do, we do sustainable homes or sustainable living or sustainable yeah. apartments or a sustainable house. Or, yeah. Like I just said four keywords without starting. But well, then you add an S to all of them. Well, that's eight. <laughs> or you start yeah. putting uh, local areas, so sustainable living, uh, Parramatta, Sydney, Castle Hill. Like you start adding all them up. But then you go eco friendly. Like you just find yourself with hundreds yeah. of keywords without even trying. Yep. So then out of the 500 or 1,000 keywords, some of them are going to be pretty useful. Some yep. of them are going to be pretty useless and then everything in between. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so, so how do you go about finding those keywords? Well, the, the place I always start is a free tool. It's um, Google search console. So if your site is on Google, Google will be, have been collecting information about what keywords people are using to find it. So you can go to search console and sign up for an account, verify your website, and then look at the list of keywords that you're already ranking for. And that's usually where I start. Uh, and, I, and I will export yep. that list and then get rid of the junk. There's a, Sometimes you'll just find the most random things, you know, that you don't yeah. want to be yeah. ranking for. People's names and sort of yeah. strange it's stuff. A good, yeah. it's, it's a good thing to know what you're already ranking for because you might be like, why am I ranking for that? And you can dive deeper and look at the page that is ranking for that term. And you can rework that page if you need to, because that's not the term you want to be ranking for on that page. Yeah. But um, it's a great way, great place to start because it gives you, you know, it'll give you up to, depending on how many keywords you're ranking for, up to a thousand keywords that you can start with. And, you know, by the time you clean up the list, you might have 200, maybe a hundred or something. And you can, from at that point, you create a spreadsheet and you just, you determine what your, um, your top categories would be. You want to pick, three to five categories, depending on, yep. you know, how many types of services or products you sell and then create little tabs along the bottom that, that, uh, so you can have those categories in your spreadsheet and then just start sorting those keywords from search console into there. Um, I 
it's, it's a complicated, long process. The next step I usually do is use a tool to get more recommendations um, okay. for keywords. Now there's a free tool you can use the, um, the keyword tool in Google ads, which you don't have to pay for it to sign up. You can get a Google ads account. You don't need it. You don't need to have a paid account to use it. And there's a keyword tool in there that you can use to get keyword suggestions. So the best way to use that is to put those broad terms, determine what those top level terms are, put that in there. And then it'll give you a list of, you know, it could be up to a thousand suggested keywords and you go through and add those to your spreadsheet as well. Yeah. The ones that are relevant. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's going to point out keywords you didn't think of. Yeah. It starts coming up with other ideas. Yeah. Yes. Okay. There's a variety of tools out there that can be used. You could just search for keyword tool or keyword research tools and you can find them, but those are the free ones I can think of. So the, but the, the paid ones, they use Google ads keyword tool anyway. Yeah. Right? And search yeah. console. Yeah. Yeah. So. so they're pulling it from there. Yeah. The, the difference is that they, once they pull it, they then start doing more useful things with it for you and they save you time on the other end. That That's why they're charging you money for the. Yeah, correct. Service. They're so. organizing it in a way that makes it easier for you to organize in your spreadsheet. Because the, the hardest part is sub, is sorting your keywords into topic clusters. Because just because you filled a tab that has a general topic in it with a bunch of keywords doesn't mean that they're all related. They, they have a variety of intents. So you basically have to create keyword clusters based on intent. And that's really important. Intent. It's not just, mm. oh, because these, this set of keywords has words in common, that's not the way that you, you subsort. You want to make sure that you think through what that keyword is, the intent behind that keyword is. If you're fuzzy on it, go put it in Google and see what the results are. If the results are yeah. <laughs> related to several other keywords, then they're a good match to be in a, yeah. in a topic cluster. Okay. So at the end, you have a big spreadsheet with loads of tabs sorted by the different categories. And yeah. on that tab, it has all of the related keywords grouped together, sorted by search volume. Sorry if we're getting technical here, but then you can use that basically as your go-to dictionary whenever you need to optimize any page in your website. You can go and find it, look up the keywords. It's all done. It's all there. So that works now finished for, for potentially two years. Like Yeah. Yeah, you want to refresh it every once in a while. It's not moving. No. It's not moving that quickly. You don't need to review it every three months or something. No. I find it's really helpful to determine, the keyword map is helpful in determining keywords that you may already be ranking for. So if you, you highlight a keyword in your keyword map, it's something you want to rank for it, and you go look for it in Search Console, it'll tell you if you've already got a page that's ranking for that term. And then you can revisit that page, perhaps, if it's not ranking as well as it could. And you can use, you can put notes in your keyword map or whatever you need to do. You only want to target one set of keywords per page. Um, yeah, gotcha. And uh, yeah, you can you can re-optimize pages that may already be ranking. It's a it's a it's a great way to just connect the dots. All right, so that's the keyword map. You've now got that. It's like if you're building a house, you've now laid the foundation. You're ready to move on to the next stage. So stage two is siloing. Now, I remember in like 2013, Matt Cutts releasing a video on YouTube. Matt Cutts used to work for Google at saying, this is how you should arrange your website. And he explained siloing. He didn't call it that, but it was basically siloing. And then <laughs> what, the, what the SEO community said was, well, if Matt Cutts is saying it, it must be like nonsense. <laughs> You know, it's 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 Google uh, trying to trick us, and then nobody did it, except for this guy called Bruce Clay, uh, who's like, okay, let's try it, and uh, and so then he's become like the siloing guru. He, he loves it. Yeah. Um. And and it's really kind of stupid thinking to be that suspicious and <laughs> of Google. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, because they're actually saying, hey, this is what works. So I'm going to use an analogy to explain this and then we'll get into a bit more detail. But I want you to picture in your mind that drawer in your kitchen, the one below the cutlery drawer, we'll call it the junk drawer, that has 
every piece of crap from your kitchen that you don't know where else to put. It's got scissors and sticky tape and pens and uh, elastic bands and pegs. It's got all sorts of stuff. Like you don't know where to put it. It goes in there. What? That's kind of like what Google sees when it comes to your website. It goes in and it sees all this stuff and it seems quite unrelated because it's just all jammed together and there's kind of crap everywhere. The bigger your website, the more confusing it is to Google. You got to remember that Google is not a human, it's a bot. So it's just trying to find themes and trying to understand what your pages are about. What siloing does is it takes all of that stuff and starts to sort it into uh, categories like the cutlery drawer above it, which has clear knives, spoons, forks. It's got very clear, we'll start calling them silos, right? Clear silos where you can go, oh, this section is about knives. Um, with your business, you're going to find that there's maybe three to five categories of what you do. Some businesses, there's plenty more, um, depends on the size, but often probably four times out of five, that's, there's only a handful. And you need to start to organize all of your pages into those categories. So then the URL structure, and getting a little technical again, will be like website.com forward slash category one, and then everything that falls under that category would then be following the, the slash after that. So then it all sits in the one folder. And then Google goes, uh, what's a good example here, Rich? Should we... Uh, products, probably. Yeah, yeah a pr products uh, like, so hair care products, right? All your hair care products then sit under hair care, forward slash, and then they're all together. And instead of Google seeing a big mess of, you know, there's a, you know, one particular product here and another one there, and they're all over the place, it sees them all together. And then it can see a clear theme. I hope that makes some sense because now Google really understands what your website's about much more clearly and is much better at indexing you. And what we've seen over the years is that the bigger the mess, the more we clean it up, the more instantaneous the results are. Bruce Clay talks about this a lot. It's like, we launched this thing and kabam, they had a 100% increase in, in traffic in uh, within a month. It's like crazy yeah. stuff. Part One important step in there is that uh, when you set up that new URL structure, it, oftentimes it will, the, the internal links will roll along and you will, because the internal linking is what really determines the silo in Google's eyes, because Google's just yeah. following links. So when you set up the URL structure, it's oftentimes it will have that roll on effect of automatically siloing like blog articles and things like that, because they'll be under there, but you do have to do, and I, I know we're going to talk about that next, but internal linking is, is the thing that really determines yes. your siloing. Would well, you want to explain in internal linking in sort of layman's? Sure. So that's when it's the links that you have on your website that link to other important pages that are related. So, you don't want to have all of your pages linking to each other. That's what that junk drawer is that James is talking about. If you have all, if you had all your pages linking to everything else on the website, Google just doesn't know what is separate categories from others. So by creating these silos, you, we're not saying you can't link out of those to other related products, but generally you want to have a strong internal linking hierarchy within that silo where you're linking to the important pages from your products and to your products and, or services or whatever. So on your product pages, you want to make sure that you're linking back up to that parent page. And um, on the parent page, you want to make sure that you're linking to those products. So they sort of reinforce each other. And you can see from that internal linking structure. So if you have a, a product that is, and you have another product that is not related at all to this one product, you don't want to be linking to that other product from this one that spoils the silo. So yeah. Hopefully that's simple enough to understand. <laughs> yeah. So the, yeah, the, the, the linking is essentially what Google sees and Google, the entire Google thing is about following links, yeah. linking all around the internet to, I guess there's billions of pages, right? Yeah. So, so just quickly, you want to use those big categories and you want to put them in your main navigation. So Google can clearly yes. see this is what the website's about. 
then underneath the, that, when people click on that navigation, then they, they're in a silo. And yeah. so that helps Google. And this yeah. really brings clarity for people that are using the website as well yeah. as Google. It's, it's not just a tricky Google thing. It actually helps people travel around your website. One of the mistakes people often make, I see, see it all the time, is that they think, oh, I've got to have every product I've got in my main navigation. And what all <laughs> that does is um, it, it's, it diffuses your, your page rank power amongst all this. What it's you're doing that thing that I just said where you're linking to every other page on your website within each other and it's it mess it has the potential to dilute the silo. Um so yeah really the best menus are the simplest ones where you're linking to those categories. And then people know if they go to, you know, if they go to the hair care page, they'll be able to see the listing of hair care products. You don't need to list them all underneath the hair care category. Um, yeah, that's just yeah, redundant yeah. and unnecessary, and it's not good and for difficult SEO. to navigate. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's not, How many not times great... you, you go to this menu and it's like, oh, a drop down, another drop down? It's like, no, you don't need that. <laughs> yeah, I know there's lots of big sites that have those, like JB Hi-Fi and Amazon even have those, have those. But they're they're the breadth of their categories is much greater than most businesses, so it's sort of necessary on their part, but. You have a business that size, maybe it's fine. Okay, so that's siloing. And what that means is you've done your keyword research in stage one. You've now structured your website around those keywords. So it's now it's like putting the walls up of your of your house. Yeah. Um, and the roof. Now, stage three is to go through what we call the 50 plus point checklist. We have a list of, I think it was 57 last time I checked different things that you got to do now without listing them rich. Yeah. <laughs> Cause we'll be here all day. What's involved with this. Uh, to put it simply, it's just making sure that you've, you're in control. If you're a business owner doing this on your own, you want to make sure that you're in control of all your data. So you're connected to Google analytics. You're, con you're connected to all the various um, Google tools that you need. And those would be analytics. Number one, Yep. Search console, number two, tag manager, number three, if you're savvy enough to use tag manager, tag manager is not necessary, but we use tag manager to communicate with analytics to track, uh, how your, you know, how, how people are using your website. So we use tag manager to track what we call conversions or goal completions. So when somebody s clicks on an, a phone number, clicks on an email address, clicks or submits a form we can attribute that to a specific channel. So we know whether it's coming from SEO traffic or a Google ad or social media. And that's an important thing to know if, you know, if you're, if you're investing in any of those channels, you want to, you want to know what your return on investment is. And that's a good way to figure that out. So this list is all about setting up those connections and making sure that your site is submitted to Google Bing. Those are the two that we, that we work with for the most part, the other ones, they'll, they'll catch on. <laughs> they usually find you because they crawl Google yeah, as well. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but you know, you just want to make sure you just want to, as a, as an agency, we want to make sure that we've got access to the hosting account if possible, so that we can make sure that uh, we can back up the website. We we're developers as well. So we like to make sure that we're, you know, we're making backups in case, you know, in the rare instance that something breaks that we can just back it up really easily. Um, yep. but you just, you want to tick all your boxes. There's a whole, you know, like Jane, it's like at least 57 points of just technical things, making sure that you're connected to all the systems. We also run some, uh, page load speed and performance tests and yep. install plugins for that. And, um, and we also in this, in this checklist, we set up some, initial tracking documents because we like to track keywords over time. And we also, there's a variety of documents that we use to track our work over time, which helps us be able to refer back to what the original version of the website was. And also the client can access them at any time and, and know exactly what's going on. It's just a, a good check and balance on our work. So. Okay. So this is really needed. Like it's got to be done. There's no, there's no skipping Google Analytics or, or I mean, I guess you could quickly install yeah, it. Yeah, you could do It's just flying blind then. Yeah, you're just flying blind. You don't know if anything you're doing is working. It's it's how you measure progress with all this data. So. And in SEO, there's 
Google doesn't have a customer support line for SEO. It's the only <laughs> way that you can tell if you if what you've done has made a difference. That's that's the only way that you can tell because there's just no way to um, get Google to help you in that way. So you've got to make a change, make a note that you've made a change, and then see how it performs after you've made that change. Yeah, if it goes in yeah, the wrong yeah. direction, you've done something incorrectly and you need to fix it. If it goes in the right direction, good. So stage three is the 50 plus point checklist. It is not the most fascinating piece of SEO, but it's a hundred percent necessary. It's like jumping into a car and tuning up the engine. Um, no one understands what's going on, but you know, you need it. Um, and it's going to track everything. It's going to make things load faster. You're going to be able to understand your results moving forward without it. Yeah. It's literally going forward with a blindfold. Yep. So that leads us to stage four. The last one is to create a 12 month rollout plan. So when it comes to SEO and explaining what SEO even is, is that it's based on an algorithm where a Google bot comes along to your website. It reads every single line of code that it can, looks at all the pages and then makes decisions based on an algorithm with over 300 factors on it, where it's going to place you in its search results. There's 300 things. Well, there's over 300 things. So you get, this is one of the reasons why you need a plan. You just can't deal with 300 things. It's just next to impossible. So we group them into five areas. So there's one is technical SEO, which stage three is mostly addressing technical things. Uh, the second one is content. This is all the words, images, and videos on your website. Super important because it's got to have keywords in it so Google understands it. Uh, the third one is local, which is... If you have a physical presence in a particular suburb, then you need to have the name of that suburb on there. Or if you re if you service particular areas, particular cities, etc., you need to be optimized for those uh, those locations. The third one is backlinking, and this is the health and uh, number of your backlinks. I think over the years, backlinking has been the most abused part of SEO. Uh, maybe 15 years ago was sort of the thing that everyone did. They did all sorts of dodgy practices and, and Google killed all that off. I want to say 2012, something, something yeah. around there. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you really need a good strategy for that to build your authority. And the last one is user experience. How does it look? How does it feel? How do people use it? Is it working well? Do you have good clear uh, calls to action in, in good places above the fold? Uh, maybe repeated down throughout the page. All that sort of stuff is user experience. So I've explained that because when we do a rollout plan, we have to allocate time and resources to each of those five areas. Now, if you're going to do this yourself, and I'd suggest most of you can't unless you uh, have web dev skills, content writing skills, analytical skills and a bunch of extra time yeah well this is my point it's going to take time so you're going to say how many hours a month am i going to allocate to this 10 20 40 you're going to do a whole week like how, how much is it going to be what you essentially got to do is say oh, i'm going to allocate a certain amount of time to these different things what we do is we put together a spreadsheet 12 months of planning and we're going to say okay in month one we're going to spend 50 percent of our time on technical because we've got to square away a lot of technical things that are site-wide. Probably month two or three, we'll do the same. But maybe for content, we'll do 25%, and maybe we'll do 12% on local, another 12% on backlinking for the first three months. So we've just broken it up, and maybe nothing on user experience for the first three months, because we've really got to get things set up and actually see what's happening. The second three months, maybe the technical drops right back to 10% because we fixed up most of it and now we're going to invest 50% in content because we really want to start building out great content. But maybe we're investing a bit more in, uh, in backlinks as well. All of this to say is that you want to have that map of what it is you're doing each month. So we build that, then we share it with our clients. So the idea that the client doesn't know what we're doing never happens. They're like, I know exactly what they're doing. Here's my document that says so. We've shared it with them and it's quite clear. Then we do a monthly video report. We're explaining the results so you can actually understand what's happening. So it's transparency for the client. It's also the working document that the team used to know what they need to do this month. So it's a 
it's a management tool as well. So that 12 month rollout plan is the thing that then drives the actual execution of this SEO strategy we put together uh, over the fir- over the next 12 months. Yep. So they're the four stages. I might repeat them. Number one is your keyword mapping. Number two is your siloing. Number three is your 50 plus point checklist. And number four is the 12 month rollout plan. So once you're there, then you're ready to start SEO. (laughs) Then you can actually get into it. Um, So we call this month zero. This is uh, the thing we do before we get started. Anything you'd like to add to that, Rich? I don't think so. It's pretty, pretty good. All right. So this is what we do all day, every day. Thanks for joining us, Rich. Appreciate all your insights. Uh, Now, if you found this informative and a little daunting and would like us to help you with next steps, uh, we can do this whole process for you. It's our premier SEO planning process. We've developed it over the last 10 years to put together a really robust and holistic SEO strategy that helps you grow your business. So you can just Google the online co and click the red button on the homepage to book a quick chat. And we'd love to speak to you and see how we can best help. This episode of Digital Marketing That Puts People First was brought to you by The Online Co. Production and music by Harry Parnwell. You can find us at theonlineco.net. If this has been helpful, please feel free to share it with someone who you also think it might help. Uh, We'd love you to subscribe and leave us a review. Thanks for listening. Take care.